in the mid 1990s, music, specifically guitar driven music, was in a weird place. Hair metal was fading out and grunge was coming into its own. In 1994, we had a nuclear bomb drop in our laps in the form of Green Day's mega hit, Dookie. That same year, we got the Offspring Smash, which is the highest selling independent record of all time, Rancid, Let's Go, Bad Religion, Stranger Than Fiction, No Effects, Punk and Drublick, and many other very important punk rock records. This was the peak of it. But throughout the entire decade, punk rock became the most important genre of music. We got the Warp Tour. Bands like Sublime and No Doubt were getting huge with hit songs that included elements of punk rock or ska. And then Blink-182, they were getting started with their first LP, Buddha. When a specific sound gets popular, it causes a ripple effect, where more extreme versions of that music may not reach the same heights, but gets the opportunity to grow nonetheless. That is what we are here to discuss today. The more extreme version of the pop-punk sounds of Green Day and The Offspring, we're talking about street punk. Street punk, according to Wikipedia, is an urban working class based subgenre of punk rock, which partly emerged as a rebellion against the perceived artistic pretensions of the first wave of British punk. Street punk emerged from a combination of styles from oi and hardcore punk bands. A key band in defining the aesthetic was the Exploited, who were from Scotland and began really making some noise with their iconic 1981 album, Punk's Not Dead. Though they are often credited with starting street punk, they began playing more crossover thrash and hardcore music later in their career. But that album, it kind of started it all. Street punks generally have a much more ostentatious and flamboyant appearance than the working class and skinhead image cultivated by many oi bands, often having multicolored hair, mohawks, tattoos, heavily studded vests and leather jackets, and clothing, especially plaids, adorned with political slogans, patches, and or the names of their favorite punk bands. The 90s was a very big decade for street punk bands. When pop punk broke in 1994 with Green Day putting out Dookie on a major label, the offspring dropping smash on Epitaph, and even bands like NoFX and Rancid doing their thing that same year, there was a trickle-down effect. Think of it like a funnel shape, with Green Day and similar bands at the top, and more hardcore street punk type bands at the bottom. The bigger the top gets, the bigger the bottom will get. So with the emergence of pop punk and it getting as popular as it did, more street punk bands started to emerge. See, this is why we always need these type of gateway bands. Because kids will get into the more accessible acts like Green Day and The Offspring. I mean, this is literally me that we're talking about here. And then they'll get curious and dig a little deeper to bands like No Effects and Rancid. Then, some will go even further and find bands like The Unseen and then The Casualties. That goes all the way down to noise bands, crust punk, D-beat, etc. Technically, we have Green Day to thank for all the bands that we are about to discuss. From the early and mid 1990s through about 2005, street punk was a huge wave coming through the music scene. Uh, kind of went back underground after that, but here are a few of the bands that were credited for bringing street punk to the masses. Never fell in love, so I fell in love with you. Now I know what a good time was, so I had a good time with you. If you want to feel that you want to get right in the music, scarf it out. For with music hits, I feel no pain at all. Rancid, probably the most successful of the street punk bands. I personally have always considered them just a punk rock band, but they get brought up in every single list of street punk bands that I've seen. From the ashes of Operation Ivy rose the phoenix that we know as Rancid. Their earlier stuff was definitely more on the street punk side of things, all the way up to 1994's Let's Go. They did And Out Come the Wolves in 1995, and then Life Won't Wait in 1998. And those albums, while a lot more diverse than their earlier stuff, had plenty of street punk offerings, but it wasn't until the summer of 2000 when they dropped Rancid 5. While not my personal favorite, a lot of people seem to love that record, and it has their most ferocious songs to date. Outside of that, you can check out their first album from 1993, also titled Rancid, and their first couple of 7-inch releases, one on Lookout, the Molotov 7-inch from 1992, and then Radio 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 in 1993 on Fat Records. All of that stuff 
is ska free and I would consider it street punk. The Casualties, probably the first of this crop of bands. They're from New York City and have one of the more explosive vocal stylings with George and now David on the mic. From 1997 to 2004, they put out some street punk classics. For the Punks in 97, Underground Army in 1998, Stay Out of Order in 2000, Die Hards from 2001, On the Front Line in 2014. In 2007, their singer George Jorge retired from touring amid some pretty nasty allegations, and David Tejas of the Chrome Bums took over on vocal duties. The casualties are still going strong to this day and touring regularly. From Boston, Mass., The Unseen. The 1A to the casualties, in my personal opinion. Formed in 1993 in Hingham, Massachusetts, relocating to Boston later. One of the more prominent bands to revive street punk. The Unseen was originally called The Extinct. On the first three records, their bass player, Trip Underwood, was doing vocals. And then on their breakthrough album, The State of Discontent on Hellcat Records, they had a lineup change. And Mark, who was their drummer on the first few albums, took over on vocals, and he has remained the band's frontman to this day. A global threat. Short, fast, and pissed off songs. If you like The Unseen, then you'll certainly like A Global Threat. They formed in Maine in 1997, and then relocated to Boston the next year. They released a few things in the mid-90s, but really took shape in 1999 with their album, What the Fuck Will Change, and then in 2000 with Until We Die, those two releases being their best in my opinion. Mark Unseen joined the band for a while, and was coincidentally a part of the two aforementioned records, maybe being the key ingredient to the band being as good as they were for a while, I don't know, I think that's up for debate. I like the band regardless. Crumb Bums, Austin, Texas' answer to the casualties in the unseen. Formed in the year 2000, and as far as I know, they're still active. The singer, David Tejas, now sings for the casualties, and his other band, Starving Wolves. Crumb Bums have a bunch of releases, but their main offerings would be a demo from 2001 and four full-length albums. All of them are good, but my personal favorite is As the Tide Turns. They have some thrash and hardcore influences in their music, and David has some extraordinary vocals. The Virus Formed in 1998 in Philadelphia The Virus is currently active and playing shows After an almost decade long hiatus from 2004 to 2013 Another charged hair type of street punk band With a more scream yell type of vocals Similar to Mark Unseen they only have two albums on Spotify currently, Nowhere to Hide from 2002 on Punkcore Records, and System Failure from 2017. They also released Still Fighting for a Future in 2000 on Charged Records. My favorite is Nowhere to Hide. The closing track, My Life, My World, that's still in regular rotation for me to this day. I absolutely love that song. Anti-Flag. While they are now a canceled, disgraced band, Anti-Flag was a huge band in the 90s and a very important part of the street punk movement of that era. They were probably the most consistent and biggest street punk band as they were on a major label. I would made a statement on a video a couple weeks ago about the Unseen and the Casualties being in competition for the number one spot in this genre, but in doing research for this video, I was reminded about the major label stuff that Anti-Flag did and may have to concede that while ending in a huge mess, for years they were the biggest street punk band around. They formed in 1988, but didn't drop their first album, Die For Your Government, until 1996. That's the album that I got, and I fell in love with the band with it. It's really unfortunate what was happening for all those years. This band could have been absolute legends, and for all the right reasons, had their singer not been doing just atrocious things behind closed doors.
Oxymoron. Hailing from Germany and forming in 1992, their first real public performance was at an annual punk rock festival in their hometown, along with other local bands. After the show, they were offered several slots as support acts for more established punk rock bands all over the world. Oxymoron songs are a little more mid-tempo than some of the other bands I've mentioned thus far, with a more singing type of vocals. Think Lars Fredrickson of Rancid, kind of. It's really easy to understand what Sucker is saying, which is really nice. Lots of 77 style punk just turned up. Great band. I only owned a couple of their albums over the years, but they were all solid. In doing research for this, I found out that everything they put out is pretty good. And the recordings are all of similar quality, which is nice as well. That's often an issue that I run into. Early releases from some of these street punk bands, they're well written, but they're poorly recorded. It doesn't always matter, but I sure appreciate a good quality sound. Oxymoron packs their songs with catchy hooks, sing-along parts, and representation for the blue-collar, lower-class folks of that part of the world. Oxymoron is as much an oi band as a street punk band, in my opinion. Those two genres are very closely related. Honestly, maybe those two things are the same thing, but with just different clothes. While not announcing an official breakup, Oxymoron has been on an indefinite hiatus since 2002. 2006 saw the release of somewhat new material in the Noise Overdose split EP with Bone Crusher. The EP contained previously unreleased tracks, along with live footage from a 1999 Hamburg, Germany concert. 2006 also marked the release of the first album of Sucker's solo project, Bad Co. Project, entitled Sucker Stories. As of 2014, Oxymoron officially disbanded. Their website being no longer active with a message simply stating, Sorry you guys out there, Oxymoron doesn't exist anymore. It's up to you to keep the spirit alive. Defiance, anarcho street punk band from Portland, Oregon, formed in 1993. They have been cited as major influences on bands such as Anti Flag, The Unseen. In the winter of 1993, members from the bands Deprived, Unamused, and Resist formed their first lineup of Defiance. Shortly after, the band entered the studio to record what would later become the first two EPs. The first few years saw the band release a couple of EPs and do some pretty extensive touring. After 19 countries over two and a half months, the band went into inactivity until their first LP, No Future, No Hope, was released in early 1996. Defiance is one of the smaller bands on this list, somehow. They have amazing songs and a very similar sound to early stuff from The Unseen. Their first album, No Future, No Hope, was something that I listened to an awful lot in the early 2000s once I got my hands on it. The title track? That one's still in rotation on my speakers to this day as well. Lower Class Brats Founded in Austin, Texas in January of 1995 and now based out of Southern California since 2017 the band is still active today they play a mix of punk, oi, 70s glam and straight ahead rock and roll this is one of the bands that I never really got into for some reason I think simply because they used imagery from A Clockwork Orange it's a movie I can't stand it's on a lot of their merch since the cover of an album is the first thing that someone sees, it can make them gravitate towards the album or it can send them in the other direction. Nothing wrong with it, of course. I just think that's what happened to me. They have song titles like Ultra Violence and Just Like Clockwork as well, making me think maybe they're a themed band or something. I don't really know. Their 1997 album, Rather Be Hated Than Ignored, was everywhere for a few years, and I definitely saw them play some. They played all over the place, and they played with a lot of bands that I liked being from Texas and all. Sounding more like Oxymoron covered in milk than the casualties, the band is actually pretty good. And I added a couple of their songs to the Punk Rock Review playlist on Spotify. The Havoc. Coming around in the early 2000s, from California, The Havoc dropped two EPs, and then in January 2003 dropped their first LP, Our Rebellion Has Just Begun. Then, in January of 2023, they came back to remind us who was pissed off and dropped Our Rebellion Continues. It's an all-out assault on our senses. The Havoc is a pure street punk band in the same vein of the Unseen, the Casualties, and Defiance. If you like those bands, you'll like this band.
Complete Control, one of the best street rock and roll punk bands to come out of Austin, Texas. Raw, fast, real punk with no fillers. They have a lot in common with California street punk band Pistol Grip, especially in the vocals. Kind of a monotone mid-pitch that I personally really like a lot. Unfortunately, they only have one LP, 2004's Reaction, on Slab of Wax Records. Posted on the website Oi of America in 2015, it says, They take the street punk sound and blow it up, with a singer who does not push the tempo and sings just behind the racing beat. He delivers the dark tone in his voice that plays nicely with the melody of the guitars. Very much like Criminal Damage, they deliver lyrics that are not typical. The band has a bleak outlook on the world, and that comes through in the stark lyrics of murder, rotting flesh, substance abuse, and corrupted government. Hell, that is just the first couple of songs. On the song Blame, the band paints this picture of a none too caring government with brilliant imagery. I think they said it perfectly. If you haven't heard Complete Control, I'd urge you to go do so right now. The band's great. They only have one album, so it won't take a long time. Damage Case, another great band from Texas. Honestly, I had no idea so many great bands came from my home state. Damage Case, they're from Dallas. They deliver the raw energy of early melodic punk rock with the intensity of a more modern hardcore sound. In 2003, they gave us an amazing EP and a little sample of things to come with a battalion of bombers and a chorus of fire. That came out on Slap of Wax Records. But then, in 2006, we got their lone full-length, Tyranny, from Punk Core Records. Damage Case have more in common with the Unseen and the Virus than stuff like lower-class brats of the U.S. bombs blistering fast and melodic street punk with gang vocals to sing along to and guitar solos to bang your head to. Even the occasional double bass blast through the speakers. Damage Case is great. I honestly hadn't thought about them in a long time. Going back to their album though, I remember how much I used to love this record. Clit 45 a punk rock band from Long Beach, California that formed in 1996. They played traditional fast punk influenced by the adolescence, poison idea, and bad religion. Though in my opinion they sound more like traditional street punk, more like Defiance, than the bands that are cited as their influences. Dropping a demo in 1996 and then EPs in 98 and 99, they are one of the older bands on this list. Then they released Tales from the Clit from ADD Records in 2000. Their second and third albums were published by BYO Records and distributed by Cargo Records in Europe. They toured with the Casualties, The Briefs, New Mexican Disaster Squad, Complete Control, The Riffs, The Craze, Defiance, Dropkick Murphys, The Virus, The Unseen, Bad Religion, and A Global Threat. Their last show was in Portland, Oregon in October of 2006. After a year-long hiatus, Clip 45 announced that they have officially disbanded on Christmas Day back in 2007 via their MySpace page. Following their disbandment, Clip 45 played a handful of live shows between 2011 and 2019. On stage in 2019 in Oklahoma, they announced that they would never play live again. The lead singer Dave is now playing in a punk rock band called The Fiends. Their song called Hope is really good, by the way. But as far as Clip 45 is concerned, they're a super solid street punk band. But I've always wondered what's up with their name. Like, that band name is strange, right? Like, does it have a meaning or something that I don't know about? Anyways, they're pretty great if you like this subgenre. Their second album, called 2468, We're the Kids You Love to Hate, is my personal recommendation. Especially the third track on that album, it's awesome. Swingin' Utters. When I think of street punk, I usually envision bands covered in studs and spikes with huge mohawks. Bands that sound like the casualties in a global threat. But there's another type of street punk out there, I'm finding out. Bands that have music that's pretty similar to those others I've mentioned. But their vocals, they're more of a sing than a scream. A lot in common with oi bands, actually. This stuff, I'm calling it melodic street punk. The band I think of immediately when I reference this would be the Swingin' Utters. Forming in California in the late 1980s, they had a longer name. They were called Johnny P. Bucks and the Swingin' Utters. They released Give You Strength on cassette in 1991 and then Scared in 1992 before shortening their name to just Swingin' Utters. Then they released three classic punk rock albums, The Streets of San Francisco in 1995, A Juvenile Product of the Working Class in 1996, Five Lessons Learned in 1998. 
They've released a ton of music over the years. They're a favorite of punk rockers of all kinds. The Streets of San Francisco won them Best Debut Album at the Bay Area Music Awards, and they were included on the first Vans Warped Tour. They've been signed to Fat Records since 1996, releasing a juvenile product of the working class that year, and releasing seven original albums, two EPs, and a rare B-Sides compilation, a Best Of compilation, several 7-inch singles, and a live record on that label since that day. As far as their sound, they've incorporated many styles of music into it. Their sound's been described as blue-collar pop-influenced punk. Comparisons have been drawn with early punk bands such as The Clash, Sham 69, The Sex Pistols, and Stiff Little Fingers. The band have also incorporated elements of country music, roots rock, with comparisons to bands such as Dropkick Murphys and The Pogues. Man, what a great band. Born to Lose. So Born to Lose is one of my personal favorite bands of all time. Everything they put out is good. They're like an amalgamation of rancid, social distortion, swinging utters far from finished and motorhead. Formed in Austin, Texas, the Sailor's Grave website says the following way back in 2006. Born to Lose is like an all-out punk rock assault that combines beer-drenched vocals, sing-along choruses, and high-voltage guitar licks to create fist-pumping anthems that make you remember why you fell in love with punk rock in the first place. They've been called everything from street punk to pub rock, but one thing's for sure, no labels are going to stop them from serving up their own brand of Texas-flavored punk rock. The guys in the band had been kicking around Austin and cutting their teeth in other bands for a couple of years before they all eventually found their way into Born to Lose in the year 2000. After a few years and many beers in and around Texas, they decided to take the circus on the road. A couple records and thousands of miles later, Born to Lose is still at it, touring the good old U.S. of A. and eagerly anticipating the release of their new record, Sweet Misery, on Sailor Graves Records on May 23, 2006. Okay, now that album, Sweet Misery, is my favorite album by theirs. The title track is maybe my second favorite song of all time, behind only Journey to the End of East Bay by Rancid. I feel like that should tell you a lot of what you need to know about this band. They've got six albums from 2002 to 2010, and they're full of good times, sad times, and everything in between. Anthemic street punk rock and roll, in my opinion, one of the greatest to ever lay it down on wax. I had their singer, Chris Klink, on the podcast recently to talk about all of his projects, including his new band, Generation Exit. I'm putting out their debut album on tape in January of next year, and I'll have that album on the channel pretty soon. You'll be missing out big time if you don't go check this band out in their discography. And if you like it, please go check out the other bands Chris was in, Generation Exit and Nowhere Bound. Hey! U.S. Bombs. Formed in 1993 in Orange County, California by skateboarding living legend Dwayne Peters and Kerry Martinez. They play a 77 style street punk, something sort of like the Swing Nutters do. With absolute bona fide classics such as War Birth and U.S. Bombs the World, also, Back at the Laundromat is an underrated classic, in my opinion, making up only a small portion of their offerings. The U.S. Bombs have an overwhelming amount of great music. If you like the Sex Pistols, Skateboarding, Swing and Odors, and Bombshell Rocks, you need to listen to this band. They appeared on the TV show Premium Blend as the stage band during Jim Brewer's hosting stint and contributed to the song Your Country to the soundtrack for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. In March 2015, Dwayne Peters posted on Instagram, The Bombs, 1993 to 2013, RIP. In a separate post, he confirmed the band had broken up. In the spring of 2017, Dwayne Peters posted on Instagram that he was going to be getting his U.S. Bombs back together with a completely new crew. The band scheduled a West Coast tour for late summer of that year, including the It's Not Dead Festival. Then Peters announced that a new 7-inch of Clash covers was recorded and slated for release on Slope Records in 2017. Roadcase, the band's first album in 12 years, was released in November 23rd of 2018. Dwayne Peters has fallen on some rough times as of recent, and I'm not 100% sure exactly what happened to him, but he's currently, as of the time I recorded this, living out of his van with his girlfriend and selling his personal skate and surfboards and art just in order to eat. Leftover Crack, also Choking Victim. Honestly, I wasn't thinking about putting this band or these bands on this list, 
but when I asked people's opinion and for input, they got mentioned quite a bit. And when I looked up street punk bands on Google, uh, they also popped up quite a bit. Formed in 1998, following the breakup of Choking Victim, based out of New York, Leftover Cracks spans several different music genres, including hardcore punk, ska, and crust punk. They write mostly political lyrics of a radical leftist nature, opposing religion, capitalism, and authority. Leftover Crack was initially an outlet for Choking Victim frontman Scott Sturgeon, a.k.a. Stizza, to release songs that, for one reason or another, were never recorded by Choking Victim and that he also claims that are the leftover songs, hence the name. For almost two years following the band's formation, it consisted almost solely of Stizza. He recorded many of the songs that would feature on later releases onto a four-track recorder while searching for band members. Leftover Crack proceeded to record several songs with a full lineup, including Rock the 40 Ounce, Crack City Rockers, and The Good, The Bad, and The Leftover Crack. Effectively the band's theme song, I guess. Five of these songs were later included on the band's first release, the Rock the 40 Ounce 7 Inch EP, which was released by Bankshot Records on March 8, 2000. After contributing the song Crack City Rockers to the second installment of the Hellcats Give Them the Boot compilation series, the band was signed to that label, initially being contracted to produce three albums for Hellcat. The band agreed and promptly began recording songs for their first full length album, tentatively titled The Kids at School. Hellcat Records refused to release the album due to concerns over the album's controversial title, artwork, and subject matter, especially regarding the recent Columbine things. The band eventually relented and changed the album's title, art, and track listing under the promise that they would be released from their contract afterward as a result. The album was eventually released under the title of Mediocre Generica, a sly attack at Hellcat Records, who Stizza claimed wanted a more mediocre generic album compared to the original. The album was released on September 11th in 2001. As a result of legal disputes with Hellcat Records, the band was effectively left in limbo for approximately two years, unable to leave their current label, yet also unable to sign to another label, as well as being unable to release any new material under the name of Leftover Crack. However, the band did manage to bend the rules of their contract slightly, releasing a split EP with F- as the Crack Rock City 7, effectively left over crack working under aliases with additional musicians. The EP was titled Baby Jesus Stuffed Up in the Manger and was released on November 27th of 2003. In February of 2003, the band began to record songs that they had written and developed over the last few years with esteemed engineer Steve Albini, a majority of which would see a release on their second album. After recording two final songs that winter and having finally been dropped from Hellcat Records roster, the band opted to release the songs the following year as the World Trade demo for the consideration of independent punk rock record labels. Around the same time, the band was approached by renowned underground punk rock figure and ex Dead Kennedy's Jello Biafra and consequently signed to his Alternative Tentacles record label. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding this band and their singer Stizza. I don't know if they're currently active or not. He seems to be going around doing uh, solo acoustic shows. So if anybody has any information on that, throw it in the comments. So yeah, there's my list of the most prominent street punk bands from that era. I didn't mention every band that existed. There's no way for me to do that. I just think that these are the bands that most represent what I'm talking about. I just wanted to showcase this genre of music and give people that don't know much about it something to listen to. Uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the genre. I'd love to hear who your favorite bands are. I'd love to hear some really, really deep cuts, some underground bands that I probably don't know about. Please leave them in the comments for me to check out. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video. I worked really hard on it. Thank you so much for your support. Please, if you did enjoy it, throw up a like, subscribe to the channel, throw us a comment. That stuff really, really helps. Otherwise, hope you're having an awesome day. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.